Dr. Austin. <laughs> At least I didn't put it on tape. Uh, okay. Uh, when an excitatory uh, ligand is bound to the receptor molecule, it opens up a sodium channel in the receptor molecule, allowing sodium to enter the neuron. Uh, and this is a process that takes place. So, so when we're talking about um, uh, when we're ta talking about uh, electrolytes, uh, we need to talk about sodium because sodium is extremely important. It opens up sodium channels, and then sodium rushes in, and it uh, depolarizes the cell, and then we get an electrical charge. So sodium is extremely important. Chloride, of course, is extremely important because that is the, uh, uh, the, the negative ion. So we've got salt, sodium and chloride, and we also have potassium. Potassium is extremely important. So where do, where do we get our sodium chloride? Well, it's from our diet. Where do we get our potassium? Once again, it's from our diet. You're eating yogurt, and yogurt has potassium in it. <laughs> You've probably, it's probably got something some kind of fruity, it's something fruity, right? Mm -hmm. Peach? I love peaches. I've got, I have one for lunch. Okay. <laughs> peaches, of course, have potassium. Almost all fruits have potassium in them. So the more fruit you eat, the more potassium you take in. What happens if you eat too much, if you take too much potassium? Nothing, your body clears it out. It does, if it doesn't need it, it just gets rid of it. It's usually that's the way it works. Sometimes things are accumulated. Some, uh, some medications or some uh, substances are, are accumulated. The B vitamins, you can take too many B vitamins and poison yourself, as strange as that sounds. Um, but uh, they used to have a cereal called King Vitamin. I, I hope you never don't remember it. <laughs> it means that you're as old as I am. They used to have a, a cereal called King Vitamin, and it gave you 100% of your vitamins for the day. So all you had to do was eat your cereal, and you're good to go. Well, King Vitamin, it, was, it was, had a lot of sugar in it. So there were kids that would eat King Vitamin for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And of course, then they had start, had, started having problems because they were getting 300 times the, their amount of, uh, of vitamins. And most of the vitamins, of course, you just urinate out. You just get rid of them, not the B vitamins. They're accumulative. And these kids were poisoning themselves, so they were had to be treated in, in hospitals because they were eating too much B vitamins, some of the B vitamins, yeah. The B12 the vegans have because the vegans don't have the meats. Right, right. I learned that. Yeah, they have to take uh -huh. the B12. There's a couple things that they have to, they have to stick two things together to make up, you know, the amino acids that we get by eating bacon, you know, but they don't eat bacon. So. If uh, one receptor molecule, uh, molecules, if enough receptor molecules are stimulated by an excitatory ligand, the neuron's threshold will be reached and the neuron will respond with an electrical charge. If the neurotransmitter is an inhibitory ligand, it will open up chloride channels in the receptor molecule and chloride will enter the neuron. And once that happens, of course, now it's going to take much, a uh, much stronger charge in order for that thing to fire. So that's what an inhibitory uh, neurotransmitter is all about. It opens up uh, chloride channels and allows more negative ions to uh, enter the cell so that it, it, uh, it's more, much more difficult to depolarize. So we, and we need the excitatory, of course, to make our, our cells function, but we also need the inhibitory uh, neurotransmitters to control things. Uh, a good example would be uh, anxiety. Why do people, why are people so anxious? There's nothing going on. There's no danger. There's nobody outside the door with a, with a handgun. Why in the world is, are, are people so scared? <clears throat> and how do we treat them? Well, they're scared because there's something going on in their brain that's telling them that they need to be scared. So how do we control that? Well, we give them, we give them extra inhibitory neurotransmitters. We increase their, their level of GABA, and that controls their uh, anxiety. Now, the problem is that uh, the problem is if you have an individual that is uh, has an anxiety problem, <clears throat> then uh, and you you are artificially increasing their GABA level. What happens if they stop taking their pills? Since they can't, their brain can't do it by itself. And they need those pills not to be scared 
of somebody outside the door with a pistol, what happens next? And they have what we call a rebound reaction. Uh, if they just go cold turkey and go off their pills, or they forget them for a couple of days, all of a sudden their anxiety is so much worse than it was before because their body has stopped producing, doesn't produce as much GABA as it did before. So now we get a rebound reaction. So these are all things that we need to, we need to think about when we're talking about uh, treating people with pharmaceuticals. A lot of times, if we treat them, they have to stay on that drug for an extended length of time. We will have to uh, wean them off of the drugs. We can't, they can't just go cold turkey because they'll have a rebound reaction, especially if it's something like depression or something like uh, anxiety, which are the two uh, leading mental illnesses in the United States. Anxiety is actually more prevalent than depression is in the United States. So how do we treat it? We treat it with Xanax. What does Xanax do? It increases your GABA level. And now we are superficially giving you a, a, a substance that makes you not anxious anymore. So if you go off of it, we have to either wean you off of it very slow, relatively slowly, or then you'll have a rebound reaction. So these are things that we have to think about when we're, we're talking about treating people. Neurotransmitters, are, of course, are chemicals. Uh, while each receptor molecule binds exclusively to their neurotransmitter, there are similar chemicals that are structurally similar to the uh, neurotransmitter that can bind to, receptor, to the receptor molecule as well. Acetylcholine is an excitatory neurotransmitter, but the poisons curare uh, from the South American plant and bumerotoxin uh, from the Bungera snake of Taiwan bind the receptor molecule causing paralysis because it makes you spasm and it makes the acetylcholine, it uh, tells the, uh, the, the muscles that uh, they need to move. And how do they do that? Well, it, it, uh, it binds to the acetylcholine uh, receptor and it tells the, the, that muscle that it needs to move. Well, it binds it, and so it just, it spasms. And once it spasms, then you go into seizures and then you die. And that's how curare and bumerotoxin work. Acetylcholine receptor molecules are also the targets in the case of the poison muscarine from the Amanita muscaria uh, mushroom. And this is really kind of fascinating because we understand why a snake wants to paralyze its victims. It wants to kill it so it can eat it, but a mushroom doesn't eat anything. So why? It's, why in the world would this mushroom have this um, uh, uh, muscarine in it? Why? Why would it have a poison in it? What, What's that, the purpose of that? Well, there is no purpose for it. It just happens to have a, a poison that, uh, that humans will react to. And I, I've actually seen this stuff. Uh, if, you, if you know anything about mush, magic mushrooms, and I hope you don't know anything about my, magic mushrooms, or that you don't know anything, they, they look just like this. <laughs> so people get them mixed up. Uh, we had a guy that came into the emergency room, and he was spasming, and he couldn't figure out what the hell was going on. Turned out that he had taken yeah, one of the mushrooms, and he had a whole fistful of these things. Uh, but uh, it was only one mushroom that was bad, the rest of them were good. But he had, he had taken the, the muscarine, he had taken, he'd eaten the wrong mushroom, and now he was dead. There was nothing we could do about it. There's no way you can block this stuff. Once it starts, it's, 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 it has to, it, you have to clear it from your system. And if you don't, can't clear it from the system before they die, there's nothing you can do. We, you know, we gave him muscle relaxers, it didn't work. And he died, not, not a whole lot. It's not, he seizured to death, which, which is not the prettiest thing in the world. <clears throat> anyway, muscarine, uh, however, binds to the receptor molecule and mimics acetylcholine causing the neuron to fire, resulting in spasms to seizures to death. And unfortunately, once the sequence starts, there's not a whole lot you can do about it. That's what we discovered. Of course, we had never dealt with this before. As a matter of fact, we had, uh, had, had seen very little of the magic, whole magic mushroom thing. It's a, it's a psychedelic. It's a psychedelic and people take it like LSD and then they have these, uh, everything, is, everything gets mixed together in their brains. Really kind of fascinating. Uh, but those guys never come in, and all, all we and we had never seen any of this stuff before. This is in uh, Omaha, and uh, of course this guy came in and died. It was just 
And the doctor's going through the books. He's trying to figure out what the hell this stuff is, what's going on. Anyway, magic mushrooms. Uh, chemicals that mimic, these aren't magic mushrooms. These are, these are deadly mushrooms. They're not magic at all. Chemicals that mimic uh, neurotransmitters or, uh, and cause a similar reaction are known as agonists. Uh, so if I can give you a drug and it looks like acetylcholine or it looks like, well, that's uh, what uh, uh, Prozac is. Prozac looks like serotonin. So it, it allows more serotonin to be in the, uh, uh, in the synapse. So now you're less depressed than you were before. And these are known as agonists. Uh, if they uh, look like the neurotransmitter, but they block the action of the neurotransmitter, they're called antagonists. So you have agonists and antagonists. It's really kind of fascinating. I've got a film, and, and if this thing doesn't work, if you guys think, well, that's the dumbest film I've ever seen, then I'll, I'll take it out. But uh, I've used this before. This is a bunch of nurses trying to explain agonists and antagonists. Our presentation is on agonists and antagonists and receptors. A receptor is a chemical structure on the outside of a cell or in a agonist that is present in the cell. The receptor is a chemical structure on the outside of a cell or an agonist or antagonist binds in order to send the cell message. An agonist is a molecule that can activate a receptor to send the cell message. Agonist is not competitive, binds irreversibly, or competitive binds reversibly. Hi, we're talking about receptors. A receptor is like a keyhole in a door, and an agonist will bind like a key, and then you go into the door, and you will be able to go inside, like a message. <laughs> Antagonist. A molecule that binds to the receptor to block the agonist or an antagonist and stop the message from being sent to the cell. Hi. An antagonist is like uh, the wrong key that will go into the keyhole, but it will not turn. Therefore, the message cannot be sent. I guess we're at the wrong house. Okay, this information is important for nurses to know because you may be getting drugs that can act as an agonist, which will promote a physiological response to continue, or you might be giving an antagonist, which will make the physiological response stop. An example is when a person has an allergic reaction, they're producing histamine, which is the agonist, and you want to give them an antihistamine, which is the antagonist, and it stops the allergic reaction. Ha -choo! Here's some Claritin, which will stop that allergic reaction from happening. Thank you, nurse. You're welcome. I'm sorry. I think that's cute. I hope you learned something. If you didn't, I could take it out. It's, it's kind of silly. If you know anything about nurses, that's, that's about it. Nurses are goofy like that. Have you ever been around nurses? That's good because it gives us an example as to where it has a definition is clear. So you think it's okay? Yes. I'll go ahead and I do think. it. Okay. <laughs> I know. I thought maybe I just left it in there because they're so cute. They're all so cute. <laughs> Not that kind of cute. But they're, they're, you know, they're trying to teach us agonists and antagonists. And they really don't do that good a job uh, explaining it, but, of course, um, so an antagonist, uh, and they use a good example of the key and the, with the, with the, the uh, lock. Uh, an antagonist is like putting a key in the lock and then leaving it in there so that nothing else can go in, or breaking the key off. That's an antagonist, okay? So it just, it keeps the reaction from, from occurring. And that's really kind of important. I wish they talked about that, but then they were just being goofy. It's really kind of strange. Anyway, acetylcholine uh, molecule receptors are referred to as cholinergic. I looked this up, and I, because I talk about cholinergic receptors all the time. Cholinergic just means acetylcholine. That's all it means. So anything that's like an acetylcholine, like acetylcholine, will be referred to as cholinergic. 
and these are cholinergic uh, receptors. Uh, acetylcholine has at least four functions and binds to at least four cholinergic receptors. And if we look at these, uh, the, the functions of acetylcholine, this is really, really, this is an extremely important neurotransmitter because it does all of these really amazing things for your body. Without acetylcholine, you would be fairly non-functional. Uh, it acts on the neuromuscular system as an excitatory neurotransmitter, so it allows uh, Johnny back there to eat his, uh, I don't know, was that a moon pie? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> to eat his moon pie. <laughs> Acetylcholine acts on the vagus nerve and the heart muscle as an inhibitory neurotransmitter, so it slows down your heart rate. That's kind of important, especially for somebody who's had a heart attack. I forgot my pills this morning. I had to run home and, and of course, I only live over there, but I had to run home and get my blood pressure pills because otherwise, you know, I get upset about it. Ray Austin, and all of a sudden, <laughs> I'm on the ground, and <laughs> poor Aaron's down there oh, pumping away trying to keep me alive would be a sad, sad story. Okay, me dying because I thought he was incorrect. Anyway, acetylcholine is, is used by the brain to transfer memory from short-term to long-term memory, and this is one of the reasons that, uh, uh, and we talk about this from time to time, uh, or maybe we don't, maybe we don't talk about it enough, but acetylcholine, of course, is what transfers short-term memory into long-term memory. And one of the things that happens when you smoke pot is that it blocks your short-term short memory. So it kind of messes that whole process up. Uh, it uh, doesn't really have anything to do with acetylcholine. Uh, it just ha it has more to do with short-term memory and not being able to maintain short-term memory which is kind of, kind of curious. Acetylcholine acts as an inhibitory neurotransmitter to induce sleep. So if you, are, if you have a problem with insomnia, then one of the ways that we can treat that is by, <laughs> by increasing your acetylcholine level. We can do that. That's what some of, the, some of the, the Z drugs do. They increase your acetylcholine level, making it more likely that you'll fall asleep. Whew. Okay, so acetylcholine has to do with movement, it has to do with memory, it has to do with controlling your heart rate, and it has to do with you going to sleep. So without acetylcholine, you would be stupid, not being able, you wouldn't be able to move, uh, you wouldn't go to sleep, and you would probably die of a heart attack. There you go. So acetylcholine is extremely important, as you can see. It's a cholinergic neurotransmitter. Acetylcholine shares some of its receptor sites with other chemicals, and for this reason, the receptor sites are named after the alternate chemicals. For example, nicotine binds to acetylcholine sites in the skeletal muscle and the autonomic ganglia, and for that reason, these sites are referred to as nicotinic cholinergic receptors. <coughs> Tobacco. Muscarine uh, cholinergic receptors also exist in the autonomic nervous system. Muscarine, of course, kills by stopping the heart and paralyzing the intestines, as horrible as that sounds. Uh, and actually, the heart, stopping the heart is what kills you, uh, but it also paralyzes your intestines, which is kind of interesting. So if you have, if somebody has taken one of these drugs, if they have swallowed one of these uh, mushrooms, one of the things that happens when you do autopsies, is it okay if I talk about autopsies? When you do an autopsy on this guy, his uh, uh, intestines are like locked. Normally when, well, normally when you cut into somebody, their intestines just come out. But it's like the mud, they're, they're, they're locked into, into their gut and you have to yank them out. It's really kind of, sorry. Uh, I haven't done that many autopsies, but I've done enough, okay? <laughs> And of course, they tell stories. While you're in there, you know, you're, and you're working on the guy, they say, oh, you should have this, we should have seen this guy that came in two years ago. You know, that kind of thing. Anyway, it's all, always fun to talk to these people. What a strange job that is. <clears throat> there are two types of molecule uh, receptors. Um, one is fast and the other is slow. Uh, the on, uh, ionotropic uh, uh, receptors open ion channels and allow them to pass through. And this is relatively rapid. So if you have a, uh, a pharmaceutical that is ionotropic, uh, then it means that the uh, pharmaceutical is going to get into your system very rapidly. 
If it's metabotropic, on the other hand, metabotropic means uh, change moving, uh, receptors activate molecules known as G proteins. And I'm going to show you the process in the next chapter. Uh, I've got a film that shows you just how slow this, this sucker really is. G proteins bind to the amino acid guanine in its uh, many combinations. These guanine compounds may themselves open the ion channel or be part of a chain of reactions that open the ion channel uh, in turn. But it takes time, it takes a lot of time. So it all depends on whether you're taking, uh, whether the pharmaceutical is ionotropic or metabotropic. And this becomes extremely important when we're talking about drugs. Because remember, I, we've got this guy with, uh, uh, who's just t uh, eaten the wrong mushroom, uh, so we're trying, to, we're trying to do something to, to save this guy's life. Well, if we give him something that's metabotropic, he's going to seize to death before, before he has a chance. This is just an example. Of course, there's nothing you can do about it anyway. But uh, if it's ionotropic, of course, we're trying to inject him with something that, that uh, will relieve him right away. Otherwise, otherwise his heart's going to stop beating. He's going to die, which he did anyway, the one that I saw. Anyway, so metabotropic is slow, and ionotropic is, is relatively rapid. But at the same time, if you take a drug that's ionotropic, it's going to go away really fast. <laughs> but if you take something metabotropic, it spreads it out. Yes, ma'am. So did he eat the mushroom to commit suicide? No, no, no. he thought he was taking. They, they all look alike. I mean, those mushrooms look alike. They are they're red. They have a red cap and with white dots on them. Yeah, that's yeah. He, he, they gave him, somebody was picking mushrooms and they picked the wrong one. No, he wasn't trying to do it, so it just turned out that way. <laughs> uh, okay, there are four type, and I don't mean to laugh about it, it wasn't funny at all at the time. We were working our tails off trying to save this guy's life and there wasn't anything we could do. It wasn't funny at all. It was <laughs> kind of tragic. Or not that tragic. Uh, there are four types of neuronal circuits, neural, uh, neural chains, positive feedback circuits, negative feedback circuits, oscillator circuits. The simplest neuronal circuit is the neuronal chain, or the neural chain, I'm sorry, the neural chain. Uh, sensory neuron is activated by stimulus and it, and it in turn activates a motor neuron that responds to the stimulus very, 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 very quick. This is how, this is why we're able to move, able to dance, do whatever we want, we, we want to do. <laughs> <laughs> because of neural chains, and that usually has to do with movement and whatnot. Uh, which is relatively rapid. If I decide that I want to bust a move, uh, I can just do it, and I don't really have to worry about it. But if I smash my finger, it's going to take a little time before I can move my finger out of the way. And it seems like a reflex action, but the reality is it's relatively slow. As a matter of fact, uh, did I tell you the story about... Uh, I was working in a concrete block factory, and they set a, uh, a pallet of uh, concrete blocks down on my foot. Okay, I told you that story. <laughs> okay, If I had yanked back, I probably would have screwed myself up. But because my reaction was relatively slow, and I didn't realize that I, I didn't recognize the pain right away, uh, I had a chance to think about it before I tried to pull my foot away. And when I did that, I said, I'm better off with, a bro with broken bones in my feet. I mean, this is all going through my brain relatively rapidly, but at the same time, because the reaction was so slow, I was able to actually uh, do all this thinking. And I, and I signaled, signaled for the guy to lift the thing up before I tried to pull my foot away. Knowing, of course, of why I probably broken my foot, but at least I had not destroyed my ankle. And, you know, it was really kind of an odd situation, but it was, it was a relatively slow process. If you've ever been injured, a lot of times it doesn't hurt right now, especially if you're injured. Okay, anyway. <laughs> you can't feel it. Football players coming off the field with their fingers uh, dislocated, you know. Well, they didn't, well, it had to do with adrenaline, but it also had to do with the fact that, the, uh, that it's a relatively, pain is a relatively slow process, you know, which is sometimes good and sometimes bad. In, in a positive feedback circuit, the effect is uh, to increase the activity or keep it going. In a negative feedback back circuit, the effect is to stop an activity. In an oscillator circuit, the, the circuit serves as both a positive feedback circuit and a negative feedback circuit, depending on the circumstance. 
So it really all depends on what we're doing here. And I'd give you an example, but I can't think of any right off the top of my head. Most sensory neurons collect data. Uh, they converge the input through a single neuron and then diverge the signal when it arrives in the brain. The eye does this. The eye, if you think about all the receptor sites, you, or all the receptors you have in your brain, if you look at something, if you're looking at something, what you're doing is you're creating a mosaic in your brain, and your brain is putting all these things together to make a picture. That's the way it works. We're talking about tens of millions of receptors. And we're not only getting receptors, we don't only have receptors here, but we also have receptors out here. So I'm not only am I looking at Johnny, but I'm also seeing uh, the TV. I'm also seeing what's going on in the dark side of the, uh, of the room. Um, my wife was talking, and I have no idea what she was talking about this, this weekend, but she was saying uh, predators, predators have uh, irises that are uh, vertical. So if you look at a cat's eye, cat's eye, of course, is just like ours, but it, Instead of having a, a circular pupil, it has a vertical pupil. And that's so that they can concentrate on one thing. Uh, that, and that's a predator. But uh, somebody that is a prey, like a horse or a cow or a rabbit or whatever, theirs are horizontal so that they have a lot of peripheral vision. So a cat that, that concentrates on one thing uh, on a mouse or on something, that some, uh, looking for movement, uh, its eyes are vertical so that it has a very small area that it's, it, uh, it, it's focusing on. But as far as prey are concerned, they can see, they have lots of peripheral vision. So if they see movement, detect movement over here, they can take off like, like deer, you know. Deer, you, that's why you wear, when, you're, when, you, when you hunt deer, you wear camouflage. And, yeah. You don't, want, you don't want them to detect you at all. Now humans, so what kind of vision do we have as humans? Are we prey or are we predators? We are prey. I don't know if you ever thought about fighting a, a gorilla or, or maybe a, a lion or something. But yeah, try it. Try it sometime. See how you do against a grizzly bear. Who's going to win? Well, the grizzly bear is going to win, like, every time, unless you've got some kind of a weapon. And that's one of the reasons why we have such large brains, because we're prey unless we've got something to protect ourselves with. Yeah, anyway. yeah that's why we're, our peripheral, we're prey. So that's why our peripheral vision is so good. Uh, what are we talking about? We're talking about that. Each moment uh, of sight involves over 100 million receptor neurons that converge the information into the optic nerve transmitted to the brain so that the signal can be diverged into various parts of the occipital lobe for interpretation. So those of us who have been in situations that were, were relatively dangerous, our senses of, of sight, our senses of smell became far more acute because they had to. That's the only way we were able to survive. So we see we were our peripheral vision became extremely important. And this is one of the problems that my brother had in Vietnam. My brother has tunnel vision. He has tunnel vision, which means his peripheral vision is really narrow, relatively narrow. He's more like a predator. He's got a relatively narrow uh, eyesight. So he was a, not the best soldier in the world during the day, but at nighttime, he was really damn good because, well, most of our, at night, we can see light with our peripheral vision much better than we can see with our, with our uh, focused vision. So he was up. He was really good at night. Uh, and I think I told you the story. He went out there. Um, <clears throat> but he's okay now. I mean, he's okay. He's so much better now. I mean, of course, it was 50 years ago. That he did that too. I, I just have a comment. My, my whole family is, we wear glasses. Mm -hmm. We have poor eyesight. Right. But one of my sister had a, a laser treatment done, uh -huh. and she doesn't wear glasses anymore. She's like her eyesight. Is like good black sheep of the family. There's something wrong with that lady. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, you know, and I find that fascinating. I find that fascinating that there are so many uh, uh, natives with bad eyesight, and you think, why, <laughs> why, why? <laughs> How in the world did 
did this population survive before glasses? I'm not exactly sure. It doesn't make any sense to me either. But uh, if you, uh, when I was up north, uh, people, they wore glasses, but they don't need glasses to read. But they need glasses to drive and to see. It's really kind of fascinating. So white people are one way, and natives are the very opposite. White people need glasses to read, but they don't need glasses to drive or to do anything else. And these people needed glasses to, uh, and I don't, maybe it's just that population, but I don't know. I'm not exactly sure. How in the world did you hunt if you can't? I don't know. <laughs> or, or maybe that was why everybody in the room has glasses on. I have glasses, but I don't have to wear them unless I'm reading. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So maybe that's why hunters were so uh, revered, is because they had good eyesight. And they were one of few people with good, relatively good eyesight. I don't know. I have no idea. Well, maybe life expectancy wasn't that high. I don't know. But you're, I agree with you, your sister. There's something wrong with your sister. She doesn't have to wear glasses now. And that makes her the black sheep of the family. Uh, Obviously, I'm the black sheep of the family. I'm the only person that doesn't wear glasses in my family. So I'm, I'm hated by all my brothers and sisters. It's not my fault that I don't have to wear glasses. <laughs> uh, the encephalogram. Uh, the electroencephalogram is a device that uh, reads the electrical impulses put off by the neuronal activity in the brain. It's EEG. So we're looking for electricity. Uh, if you've ever been, had anything to do with uh, somebody that was brain dead, uh, and of course this was one of the jobs that I had when I was in, working in the hospital, uh, you, if you ever had anything to do with somebody that was brain dead, then what you're looking for is any blip at all. You're looking for something. <clears throat> and of course it takes a tracing and you can read through the tracings. Uh, when you're asleep, uh, there's no time, there's no time in your life when your EEG isn't blipping like crazy. Why? Because there's always activity going on in your brain. Now the interesting thing is, I don't know how interesting this is to you, but if we look at somebody with schizophrenia, their EEG is, is, is create, goes nuts, and it's nuts all the time. That's why they don't sleep, they can't sleep, because the brain is too active, it's just spinning all the time. It's like, uh, it's like taking your car out of gear and, and pushing on the accelerator. That's the way their brain is. It's just whirring like crazy. So if you look at their EEGs, they're just out of sight. There's all kinds of crazy stuff going on. There's all kinds of uh, electrical activity going on. But if we have somebody that, uh, that we're not exactly sure if they're alive or dead, uh, one of the ways of detecting death, of course, is by looking at their EEG if there's no activity they're dead. If their brain isn't working, then they're dead. That's one definition of death. I know. I don't know. This is something you can argue about if you like, whether when, when death occurs, but uh, usually that's that's what we used at the hospital. And of course, one of the things that we, that I, I, I think I told you this, as, as, as ghoulish as this sounds, one of the jobs that we did was uh, uh, harvest, we harvested organs, but we could only harvest <coughs> organs from people that were either brain dead or uh, had to be put on life support. So those are the only people that, and we had to put them on life support to maintain their organs until we could harvest them. As ugly as that sounds, I know it sounds horrible, but the reality is that we saved 9, 10, 15 lives with, uh, by harvesting their organs, by transplanting kidneys and hearts and livers and lungs, corneas, all kinds of things. Hips. So a person with schizophrenia, you know, you're saying it, it's basically taken out, of, taken out of gear and it's just revving basically. Yeah. So does that, do people like schizophrenic people, do they, does it take a, um, a physical, I guess, um, does it damage him physically as far as like, you know, not getting enough sleep or, yeah. you know, I mean, exactly. That's, that's the body has to be about some point. Yeah. Yeah, so, right. I mean, like, what are some of the physical effects for like some of uh, this? Uh, they lose sleep? a lot of weight because using your brain all the time burns a lot of energy. 
and so they either eat all the time or they lose a lot of weight. So they're skinny as mints, have no body fat whatsoever, and they can't sleep, so they can't repair themselves. And what will you happen with a schizophrenic is that they will be, uh, they try to tie up these receptor sites by chain smoking because it uh, increases the dopamine level. They've got too many dopamine receptor sites, so they, they'll chain smoke. They, that, that increases their dopamine level, and it makes them feel more normal. So the reality is they can only sleep when they're chain smoking. So it gets kind of interesting. They usually will collapse at, at a certain point, and then uh, uh, they'll sleep for a couple hours, and then they'll wake up, and, and all and this thing takes off again. And so that's when they're usually in crisis. Uh, and this, that's one of the things that we try to do with schizophrenia. We try to tie up these dopamine receptor sites uh, so that they act more normal, so that they can get sleep. The problem is, and it's really kind of interesting if, you, if you're dealing with uh, people that have schizophrenia, if they're not on medication, they have no body fat at all. If they are on their medication, they just have no muscle tone whatsoever because that's what the medication does to them. It allows them to, uh, to sleep and also, and they'll, sometimes they'll sleep you know, 18, 20 hours at a shot because their body's trying to recover. It's really fascinating <coughs> dealing with individuals with this problem. You really can't maintain that for an extended length of time. It destroys your body. Mm -hmm. that's, that's an excellent point. And that's one of the reasons why schizophrenics uh, usually don't live into their 60s, for example. You know, they just can't. Their body can't handle it. So what are we doing? EEGs are used to map uh, brain functioning and can be used to, uh, for sleep analysis or to monitor abnormal seizure activity. In case of a coma, the EEG will detect lack of activity. And we're, like I said, we're looking for any activity whatsoever. <clears throat> so if uh, we think that the individual is brain dead, and if they are brain dead, we're not going to get any activity. Uh, there was an individual by the name of Terry Schiavo. Uh, I talked about Terry Schiavo in another class, but uh, Schiavo had a heart attack, and uh, she, her brain uh, wasn't getting any oxygen for an extended length of time, for like five or ten minutes. <clears throat> and so she was brain dead. Uh, but unfortunately, of course, they were able to uh, maintain her uh, for an extended length of time. My goodness, she lived for like 15 years after she had her heart attack. Uh, they kept trying to pull the plug. The husband kept trying to pull the plug. <clears throat> Her parents wouldn't allow it to happen because they said, well, sometimes she reacts to us. Uh, but uh, the, the, the EEG told everybody that there was nothing going on in there. There was, you know, there was, she was, there was no awareness. She opened her eyes, you know. She did things, but she, it, was, it was mostly reflex action, reaction. And so uh, she was actually brain dead. So it took them 15 years to pull the plug, but they finally pulled the plug. And when they did the autopsy, her brain had really deteriorated, deteriorated to an extreme extent that it, that it was, you know, the size of, of your fist rather than the size. You know, it looks like a, <laughs> looks like a, 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 I don't know, a head of cabbage or something. You know. But hers looked like the size, it was the size of her fist because it had deteriorated that much. There was nothing going on in there. 30 million people worldwide suffer from epilepsy. Epilepsy is characterized by seizures. We're not exactly sure why uh, people have, uh, uh, why epilepsy takes place. Uh, there are a lot of different reasons for, for epilepsy to, uh, to, to develop. Um, trauma to the brain uh, can cause seizures, can cause a, an area of the brain to not function properly, and of course then they will have seizures. If this individual is in the military, <clears throat> the medication you have to take to control the seizures makes them um, unable to uh, uh, be an active duty military. Uh, so if somebody, if an active duty member uh, suddenly develops uh, seizures from their uh, uh, whatever brain trauma that they were in, uh, they have to uh, go off active duty. They can't, they can't function that way. If you have seizures, you can't drive a car because you may have one while you're driving and then now you've wrecked and potentially killed your family and killed somebody else's family or whatever, caused all kinds of horrible things. So if you have epilepsy, you can't drive. 
Chemical changes derived from me uh, metabolic faults, uh, exposure to toxins can cause seizures, mutations in ion channels. Uh, these are all causes of uh, seizures, but of course, we, we are not exactly sure why any of this stuff takes place. We just know it does. So you could have a brain uh, uh, damage, to, uh, and that will cause a seizure. It can have, uh, have to do with chemicals that you've uh, been exposed to, other toxins that you've been exposed to, sometimes medications will give you seizures. Uh, and of course, uh, if it just develops, then it it's probably has something to do with mutations in your ion channel. Uh, seizures are involuntary synchronized excitation of large groups of nerve cells in the brain. And I, have a, I actually have an MRI of um, a functional MRI of an individual having a seizure uh, at the end of the chapter. Epilepsy is characterized by various types of seizures. Uh, grand mal seizures are the most extreme uh, form of epilepsy. Uh, grand mal seizures are characterized by total muscle contraction followed by alternate jerking and relaxation. The seizures normally only last one to two minutes, but recovery may take as long as several hours. Uh, and that's a grand mal seizure. The petite mal uh, seizures are characterized by losses of awareness for about five to 15 seconds. And you can imagine if you're driving your car and you have a, even a petite mal seizure for five to 15 seconds, you're not going to be able to react to anything. Uh, so if you have seizures at all, you really can't drive, shouldn't drive. Uh, it's not safe for you or anyone else. Uh, complex partial seizures do not involve the entire brain. Uh, and actually, uh, seizures rarely in involve the entire brain. I'll, sh I'll show you a picture of the brain. Well, let me show it to you right now. There you go. There's your grand mal seizure. As you can see, it's on the right side of the brain which means it, it uh, literally paralyzes the, the whole left side of your brain. You can see we've got, we, got, we have involvement. This is a normal brain, uh, and this is a, one that's having a uh, grand mal seizure. It's relatively localized, but at the same time, it causes all kinds of uh, spasms and whatnot. Uh, usually, if you've ever been around somebody that uh, has uh, epilepsy, uh, these individuals will know when it's going to happen because they'll start smelling things. Usually it's a, it's a very bad odor. Uh, very similar to migraines. People that have migraines will smell, smell something. It's usually a relatively bad odor. Some people smell garlic breath. Some people smell uh, uh, feces. Uh, they smell something rotten. Uh, it really all depends on, on who it is and what their experiences have been as to what they smell. Uh, sometimes they'll start seeing people with uh, uh, any movement will cause light to appear behind that individual. It's called an aura. Uh, so they will actually see that before they have, start having seizures. Uh, when I was working in a rural health clinic in uh, Oklahoma, we had a, a lady that, uh, she was a veterinarian, and she knew when she was going to have a, a, a migraine headache, she would come in and and uh, we'd have to put her in a dark room and we'd, we'd give her muscle relaxers uh, because she would start smelling things. Uh, and she would start, she, <laughs> of course she's dealing with animals, so it's really kind of interesting. Uh, she'd start smelling uh, rotten places on the, on the animals, even if there was nothing wrong with the dog. And of course she's inspecting them, trying to find where they, they've got an infection. And if she couldn't find anything, she knew she was about to have a migraine headache. So she would run to the hospital, and we would uh, put her in a dark room and shoot her up with uh, Demerol uh, to quiet her down. Sometimes she didn't have the migraines, but if she had the migraines, they were fairly severe. And they last for days. She had the migraines for days. It's really kind of fascinating. Anyway, this is a seizure, of course, and this is a, an epileptic seizure, as you can see. So complex partial seizures do not involve the entire brain. The individual may experience an aura, a perceived sensation that precedes the seizure. Uh, certain personality traits often accompany complex partial seizures, uh, but it is not certain whether the traits uh, trigger the seizures or the seizures trigger the traits. Uh, I had a friend that was epileptic, and uh, he was a nice, nice guy, uh, unless he was having a seizure. And then the, before he had a seizure, he'd get angry. 
Uh, and we knew that if George got angry, then he was probably about to have a seizure. But uh, his personality changed completely. Uh, he became aggressive, he became angry. Uh, and of course, he, he was kind of dangerous at this point because he would start yelling and, and things like that would happen. Uh, so his personality would change completely. Was it the seizure? The pre-seizure, was, was he starting to have petite ball, and that was what was causing his personality changes? Or was it the fact that uh, uh, he was trying to control the seizure by getting angry? You know, that's one of the questions that you have to ask yourself. It was really kind of an interesting situation. And he uh, couldn't take it anymore, so he committed suicide in his 20s. He's one of the individuals that... Uh, that I didn't get to see uh, uh, last weekend when I went to see all my all the people I graduated from high school with. I graduated from high school with George, but uh, he committed suicide at 22. Uh, went out to the Redwoods out in California, and he parked in the tree that you can drive through, <laughs> and he shot himself in the middle of the tree. And, <clears throat> George, why in the world would you do that, George? <laughs> Uh, nice guy. Uh, so now we're going to talk about drugs. We're going to talk about drugs. I think we are. Come on, 958. Okay. Most drugs affect the brain and behavior by changing synaptic transmissions. And that's why we take pharmaceuticals at one time or another. That's why we take, uh, that's why we smoke cigarettes. That's why we take, uh, shoot up with crystal meth. We take LSD or whatever we're doing, uh, snort cocaine. All of these things change the, uh, the, uh, chemical structure in, in, uh, in our synaptic plex. Uh, axons release a chemical that either excites or inhibits the attached neuron, and this is called a neurotransmitter or merely a transmitter. And of course, we, we talked about this in the last chapter. Uh, before the 1940s, we had no clue. We're clueless. We're completely clueless. Clueless, we have no idea how to help people. We can't control anything. But then in the 1940s, we discovered neurotransmitters. And the first neurotransmitter we actually discovered was acetylcholine, which is a good thing. It's a lot, tons of it. acetylcholine does those four really major things in your body. So acetylcholine is extremely important. It gives you memory, it allows you to move, it controls your heartbeat, and it allows you to go to sleep. So acetylcholine is the first thing we discovered. The next thing we discovered was uh, adrenaline. Uh, initially, that's all we discovered was adrenaline. And then we realized, wait a minute, this other chemical is almost exactly the same thing. But it's not. It's not exactly the same thing. Norepinephrine and epinephrine were the next two neurotransmitters that we discovered. We discovered epinephrine first or adrenaline first. And then we discovered noradrenaline or norepinephrine because its structure is very, very similar but it does something completely different. In the 1950s, uh, we discovered the amino acid tra uh, transmitters. Uh, most of, their, uh, of them are, they are all inhibitory. Uh, glutamate, uh, glycine, and gamma butyric acid. And of course, of those three, the one that we talk about is of course GABA, because GABA controls your uh, anxiety level. The, the other two are, are just, actually this is the most uh, abundant uh, neurotransmitter in the, in the human body is glutamate. But of course, we discovered this one first and eventually we discovered the uh, gamma immunobutyric acid. And we needed to discover that because we needed to figure out how to, uh, uh, how to treat anxiety. Before that, we were just uh, anesthetizing people. We were giving them uh, Valium. We were trying to control their uh, anxiety by giving them something that uh, put them to sleep, as it were. In the 1970s, investigators recognized uh, that short chains of amino acids called peptides also served as neurotransmitters. This is when we uh, discovered the endogenous opioids. Now, think about this. People have been using opium uh, and heroin for, for uh, centuries. Uh, but until the 1970s, we had no clue what was going on. We had no clue what was going on with marijuana until the 1990s. Why didn't we understand it? Because we had never been able to, uh, we had never been able to break down the chemicals. 
we had never found, we didn't find a receptor site in the brain that worked on marijuana. And then eventually we found the receptor site, but we couldn't figure out what it did. Why is this receptor site here? So people were going, dude, marijuana is natural. You know, everybody should use it. You know, there's a receptor site in the brain, so evidently humans, you know, they've been using this stuff for like ever. <laughs> So evidently, we got these receptor sites for the marijuana dude. And this was, we didn't discover this until the 1990s, what these receptor sites were for. So unfortunately, we have a lot of research out there that, and we, and it's incomplete research because we had no idea what, what it was doing. But now, of course, we do know. In the 1990s, we discovered it. Uh, but of course, uh, individuals that want to legalize marijuana they go back to the research from the 1970s and 1980s and 19, before, before we discovered what was going on. And so all of these are going, eh. This is me. Science. See, we should, we should only adhere to the modern science, not the old stuff. That's not even anywhere close to being uh, accurate. Anyway, so we didn't discover opioids. We had no idea what the hell was going on until the 1970s as far as heroin was concerned. Uh, at that point, of course, uh, the other peptides are oxytocin, uh, substance P, which has to do with pain. It, it tells your brain when uh, uh, you're, you're in pain. And vasopressin. Vasopressin is, an, is the antidiuretic hormone. Uh, it, uh, it either allows you to accumulate urine or it makes you urinate. Uh, that's what vasopressin is all about. So we discovered all of these things in the 1970s. Oxytocin is really kind of interesting. Uh, when we first discovered it, we didn't know what it was for. And then we realized, well, if you look at all the animals out there, what makes them want to take care of their babies? And the answer was oxytocin. It makes them nest. So if we inject a female anything, if we inject a male anything with uh, oxytocin, it will make them build a nest. So if we're dealing with uh, actually the uh, most of the birds, the males build the nests, and the females, they're trying to induce the, the female to come in. Uh, so what, what allows animals to take care of their young and the answer is oxytocin. I used to have a cat. When I was growing up, I had a cat. And she had kittens every year. <clears throat> but she was a horrible, horrible mother. And she would not feed her babies. Which pissed me off to no end because I liked cats. <laughs> but these cats died. Kittens died because their mother would, uh, she would give birth and, some, and she'd feed them for about a week. And then she'd just take off. And then the babies would starve to death. Or she'd come back and eat them. Stupid marijuana. Yes, yeah, she's on marijuana. <laughs> anyway, her problem was she didn't have enough oxytocin. She was a horrible, horrible mother. So what happened later? Well, I married a lady who was just like my cat. <laughs> she could have the babies, and she'd take care of them for a short period of time, and then she'd take off, and that's what happened. I lost my wife a couple times. <clears throat> she left and came back and left and came back. She's, she wasn't a very good mother. Why? Well, I don't know. Maybe she didn't have enough oxytocin. Of course, I was raised by a mother that you know, liked kids. She wanted, to, she wanted kids so that she'd have somebody to play with, which makes a lot of sense to me. That's why I took care of my kids, because I needed somebody to play with. I couldn't wait until I got big enough so that I could play soccer with them. It was really great. I had a lot of fun. Anyway, and that has to do with oxytocin, as odd as that seems. So why don't humans just begat and, and then take off? Well, sometimes they do. Sometimes they do. And if they're on drugs, a lot of times it will block this oxytocin, so they become really bad parents. And then they take off and they let their, their parents take care of their, the babies or whatever. And you see this all the time. But it has to do with oxytocin. Transmitters uh, must meet the following criteria. Uh, the chemical exists in the, in the presynaptic uh, terminal, so it's there. We know it's there. Uh, the transmitter is manufactured in the neuron. <clears throat> the transmitter is released when the neuron fires. Uh, specific receptors exist to receive the, the uh, transmitter. Adequate amounts of the transmitter will make the neuron fire. 
and blocking the transmitters stops activity. Okay, so if we, if these are, uh, th these are all the criteria for a uh, neurotransmitter, for something to be a neurotransmitter. One of the uh, latest things that we have discovered uh, is nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide turns out is a neurotransmitter. So what does nitrous oxide do? Well, we know what it does now, but uh, of course it's been in there the whole time, and we just discovered it. We just discovered that it existed. Well, nitrous oxide, we've known about nitri nitrous oxide for a long time. That's laughing gas, nitrous oxide. But now we understand what nitrous oxide does as a neurotransmitter in the body, and it has to do with, the, with, with uh, sexual response. It has to do with uh, the male erection, it has to do with female response to uh, sexual excitation, and that's what uh, uh, nitrous oxide is all about, as exciting as all that is. So once we discovered this, guess what happened next? Guess what drug they came up with after they figured out what nitrous oxide was? Viagra. Viagra, exactly. Okay, now Viagra is the most uh, is the uh, <coughs> most heavily used drug in the world, as confusing as all that is. But of course, there's three of them uh, now. I think there's only three: Levitra, Cialis, and, and uh, Viagra. And they all do primarily the same thing. Anyway, so once we figured out what uh, nitrous oxide did, then we could uh, we could work on a pharmaceutical that uh, to allow men to have erections even if they weren't supposed to or something. Uh, there are two types of receptors, and we talked about this last time. The ionotropic, of course, are, that's the rapid response. Uh, the ions will pass through uh, uh, the uh, membrane, and it allows uh, very rapid re reactions. Metapotropic, of course, uh, means directed toward change. It responds slowly by accumulating G proteins to activate the other ion channels or other changes in it. Actually, I didn't do this, did I? I'm sorry. So sorry about that. Okay, this is now. I'm going to show you what uh, 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 a G protein. This this whole process. It's really kind of fascinating. It's so damn slow. When a ligand binds to the receptor site on the outside of the cell membrane, the G protein changes conformation, and guanosine triphosphate replaces the guanosine diphosphate on the alpha subunit of the G protein. The activated alpha subunit then separates from the beta and gamma subunits. The alpha subunit, with guanosine triphosphate attached, binds to the calcium ion channel, causing the calcium ion channel to open. Calcium ions diffuse into the cell and combine with calmodulin. The combination of calmodulin and calcium produces the response of the cell to the ligand. Phosphorylase activity removes the phosphate from the guanosine triphosphate, leaving guanosine diphosphate bound to the alpha subunit. The inactivated alpha subunit separates from the calcium ion channel, and the channel closes. The alpha subunit recombines with the gamma and beta subunits, and the G protein recombines with the receptor. So you saw how slow that whole process was. I mean, it's ridiculously, insanely slow. But this is okay. This is fine. Right now I'm taking um, uh, blood pressure pills. And my blood pressure pills are uh, metabotropic. Why? Well, I need the, my blood pressure to be controlled all throughout the day. Ionotropic uh, is, very, is relatively rapid but of course it goes away fairly quickly, or can go away fairly quickly depending on what kind of medication you're taking. But if it's metabotropic, like my blood pressure pills, it will control my blood pressure for 12 hours, and then tonight I'll have to take another one. I'll have to take another one of those pills, but um, it still isn't controlling my blood pressure completely. So I have to, to take, I not only take a calcium channel blocker, but I also take a beta blocker but I only take the beta blocker at night, and that allows me to go to sleep. It also it lowers my heart rate while I'm sleeping so that my body can repair itself. I know, I have to take all these medications. That's the reason I'm alive. You're like, damn, why did he, they give me those medications? I don't know. <laughs> it took the doctor forever to figure any of this stuff out. So uh, that's why I'm still alive, and, and my pulse actually is usually in the, in the 50s. 
Let me see what it is right now. The person I'm teaching right now. Uh, 70. It's 70, which isn't too bad because I'm, you know, I'm being active. If I were sitting in the chair just listening to me lather along, I'd probably be sitting there with a somewhere in the 50s. You know, my heart rate's relatively slow. Why? Well, I'm taking these blood pressure pills and it slows everything down. So let's talk about acetylcholine. We, got, we have about eight minutes. Acetylcholine was the uh, first neurotransmitter that was discovered, of course. Acetylcholine is contained in cholinergic nerve cells, and we know that cholinergic just means acetylcholine. Uh, the nucleus basalis and the media septal nucleus in the basal forebrain are cholinergic cells that project to the hippocampus and amygdala to promote memory. Uh, the amygdala is actually re relatively important as far as memory is concerned. This has to do with emotions. So the more emotional something is, the more likely that you'll remember it. So if in, in teaching, if, we can, if I can get you excited, then you're more likely to remember what I'm saying. And that may have been the reason that Ray Austin said some of the things, trying to get you guys all excited and then you'll remember it. Cells in, in this area are often destroyed, of course, with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so if, if we destroy these cells, if these acetylcholine producing cells are destroyed, then uh, you can't remember anything. All of a sudden you can't move very well. Uh, your heart rate is, is erratic, is relatively erratic, because remember, remember, it works on the vagus nerve. You don't, you sleep all the time. You can't wake up, even though there's no acetylcholine in there. And that's what happens with Alzheimer's disease, and then they die. And then they die. Um, so can we give you a medication to replace the acetylcholine? Yes, we can. But unfortunately, these cells are con will continue to die. And uh, that's why Alzheimer's disease is always fatal, because there's no way that we can protect these cells from, from death. They just go away. And once, they, once they're gone, there's nothing we can do about it. We can give you acetylcholine uh, to make you seem more lucid, but it's, 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 it's a relatively short-term uh, fix for a, a long-term problem. <coughs> so we can make you as normal as you are right now. We can continue to give you acetylcholine. It will make will allow you to remember what people's faces look like and whatnot. But eventually, of course, these cells are going to die. And eventually, you're not going to remember what anybody looks like. And then, of course, you're going to die. We watched this with, uh, and of course, the process wasn't really public, but we watched this with Ronald Reagan. He had, uh, he started suffering from Alzheimer's disease about two years before he left office, sadly enough. And he would go into meetings, and he wouldn't recognize anybody in the meetings. And he had to have somebody sitting beside him. Uh, and eventually, of course, it got to the point that he didn't know who the guy sitting beside him was. So before, he was listening to this guy, and he said, well, that's, that's your Secretary of State and stuff. Uh, so, but eventually, of course, he was barely, barely functional at all, relatively non-functional. And then he left office, of course. And he immediately went into the hospital because he had Alzheimer's disease. Whoops. Uh, the drugs atropine, uh, used to dilate your eyes, and scopolamine, uh, which is what we use as truth serum, are both acetylcholine antagonists. They block the action of the transmitter. Uh, the pedicleopontine nucleus and the laterodorsal tegmental nucleus control sleep and are cholinergic cells. Of course, these are the ones that we need. Uh, we need to induce in order for you to go to sleep. There are two main types of acetylcholine receptors, nicotinic and muscarinic. Nicotinic receptors are, are, are ionotropic and have excitatory functions, and that's one of the reasons why people smoke and it uh, excites them. Uh, I was reading about a baseball player that would uh, smoke between innings. I'm trying to think what his name was. He, he, uh, Arabu. I don't know. Anyway, he used to pitch for the Yankees. Um, but uh, he would uh, smoke, he chain smoke between innings. Uh, of course, he was in the, the American League, so he didn't have to bat. So he, he got, you know, as long as they were up to bat, he could, he could you know, sit down there and smoke. 
And that's what he did. Arabu. Arabu? I can't think of his first name. Anyway, I just read a story about him. He committed suicide. Uh, muscarinic receptors are metabotropic and can be excitatory or inhibitory. And of course, they inhibit because they, they force the uh, individual to, to have seizures. So when people smoke cigarettes, of course, what they're trying to do is excite themselves. They're trying, they use uh, tobacco as, a, as an excitatory uh, substance, and that makes them react differently. Uh, people will say that uh, uh, they're cold, so they'll smoke cigarettes. Of course, they're also a vasoconstrictor, which means they're not, they're, circulation is poor, is not as good when they're smoking tobacco. So it's completely uh, counterintuitive to smoke when you're cold because it'll actually make you colder. As strange as that seems. But they're drawing the, the hot uh, uh, air into their lungs and they, that warms them up as far as their brain is concerned anyway. But it's excitatory. Uh, so, you know, smoking a cigarette is, makes you feel like you're doing something. There are five transmitters uh, classified as monoamines in two groups. Uh, catecholamines, norepinephrine, epinephrine, and dopamine. Dopamine, of course, is the reason that we gamble. It's the reason we do anything. Dopamine, that there's a dopamine loop that makes us feel good. And so we drink, we shoot up with uh, crystal meth, we do almost everything because of dopamine, because it makes us feel so good. The endolamines, uh, there are two endolamines, serotonin and melatonin are the two endolamines. So those are the, uh, those are the neurotransmitters uh, classified as monoamines, catecholamines and endolamines. Serotonin, of course, makes you feel, feel happy. Dopamine, of course, makes you feel like you've done something. Uh, that's why people are addicted to gambling. That's why people are addicted to all kinds of stupid things because of dopamine. It's that dopamine loop. If we can get that dopamine loop uh, working, then uh, we'll, we'll, we'll keep hitting that button all day long. That's your pleasure center, the dopamine. That dopamine loop. If you can get that going, wow. If you get that whirring, then uh, everybody's happy. Okay, is it time to stop? It is time to stop. Uh, so why don't we stop right here and we'll pick this up next time. As much fun as that is. Okay. I will talk about doing autopsies next time.